Once again, everybody, it's so good to be here today. And sometimes we edit, edit the other part of the service out for later uh, when we put it on our website. So you guys do me a big, big favor. Uh, we want to welcome everyone here for the first time or have not been here in a long time. Uh, I've met people that have been watching online for six months. It was our first time last service. And so it's so good to see that and those that are watching in line as well. And can you guys do me a big favor and welcome everyone that's here today? Thank you. Amen. Well, we're in a series called It's Complicated. And uh, I've heard people say a lot, I'm in a, rel- I'm in a relationship and it's complicated. And this is what I've learned. If, if, if your relationship is complicated, chances are there's sin going on. And what I mean by sin is you're missing the mark. Things are not going the way they should. We mentioned that last week. And so I want to encourage everybody that God is not complicated. He's profound. He's unsearchable. He's incredible. He'll blow your mind. But he's not complicated in the way of it makes no sense. God is a God of order, a decent of order. He's a God that is amazing. And when we find things complicated, have you noticed how relationships have gotten complicated in our culture today? Absolutely. Well, today we're going to talk about something very, very important. But I want to share with you a story, first of all, of a wonderful, amazing man by the name of Wesley Otley. Back in 2007, this gentleman was in New York City's subway system, and there was a man on the platform right next to the train tracks, or the subway tracks, and the man went into an epileptic seizure. And when he did, he fell into the train tracks. This man, in a millisecond of time, left his two children behind, his two daughters. He jumped on the tracks. He got on top of the gentleman, pushed him down with all of his might as the train came, and the train passed him over, and there was about that much space, and it clipped some of his clothing, and he saved the man. An incredible thing. In fact, he was at the State of the Union. Uh, President Barack Obama at the time uh, acknowledged what he did. An extraordinary act that only took a moment. He was willing to lay his life down to save somebody, and even a friend, or someone he didn't even know. You know, Jesus says the following, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And this, this gentleman did it for a complete stranger. You know, Jesus did it for us. He laid down his life for us. And as a result of that, we have an opportunity to be here today. We have an opportunity to have a life But what's so interesting to me when I think about this, if I was going to lay down my life for my wife or my children, I'd be willing to do it on a moment's notice. But you know what it is, everybody? How about the everyday laying down your life? Laying down your life when you don't get your way. Laying down your life when you have a disagreement with your spouse or someone in your family. And what happens is we're willing to do the big one, but often it's the daily death that is important. And until you and I truly die, we cannot truly live in a relationship in Christ and being one in marriage. Today we're going to be talking about marriage. And I understand in this room and those watching online, there are those that are, have been divorced. And, and maybe it was your fault. Maybe it wasn't your fault. Maybe you're here today and you're married to somebody and you're just doing it because the Bible says not to divorce. Or maybe because you had the kids. Or maybe you're in a situation things are going great. I have news for you that God's word does not return void. And God has a structure. God has a way he made the culture. God has a way he made the world. He's the one that designed relationships. And his ways work. And his ways are beautiful. His ways are life-giving. And when you go away and you diverge from God's design, what happens, you, get, you divert yourself into destruction and into complication. So this is what we talked about. And in Jesus... We talked about that. And also it says in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So we'll be talking about that today, everybody. Whether you're married or not, this applies to everyone because every relationship finds its genesis in God Almighty. I just want to go ahead and, and just kind of review for a few moments. When someone says, I'm in a relationship and it's complicated, there's a problem. You see, Jesus has made it abundantly simple. And, you know, sin complicates your life. God's ways simplify your life. And let me explain what I mean by that is that Jesus' greatest command, he said, God's greatest command, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. That's the number one commandment that we have. When you love God with everything you have and you receive love back, you are a more complete person. Love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. 
and all the commandments rest. You see, everybody, every relationship, if that is the, the rest of the Bible works itself out if we do those two things. How simple is that? But what do we do? We do everything else but that often. And so Jesus makes life extremely simple, but it's profound, and you can never get to the depths of God's mercy, his love, his grace. As the old hymn said, if every man were a scribe by trade and every stalk as a pen and the oceans were the ink, to write the love of God would, draw, would, would, would drain the oceans dry. It's the truth. The, the, the love of God, the amazing grace of God is so powerful and so wonderful, you can never get to the end of it. But it's, it's in simplicity, but a depth and a profound that you can never completely understand Totally, but it's simplistic. And sin complicates your life. Have you noticed how sin has complicated our culture? How complicated everything is? It does not need to be that way. And so today we're going to be talking about that. And so just to kind of move forward just a little bit, let's move forward. Today's marriage is this. God has a plan for us. God wants us to become one in marriage. And so whether you're married or not, next week we'll be talking about sex and dating. And relationships. That's next week. Don't worry, it won't be too bad. It'll be like PG-13, sort of. All right. How do we become one? Well, there's two definitions in the English language of one. We have the singular, like we have one. We have a cupcake truck. There's only one left. So that's one. Or you have the, the plural, uh, which makes, simply means together in unity. For example, I, I last night watched the Knicks play the Lakers, and it was a good game. You know, back and forth, went to extra uh, overtime, and I'm like, I have to go to bed. I got church tomorrow, so I didn't know what happened. But they were not playing as one. <laughs> and so when a team plays as one, there's unity. Great things happen. The Bible says one can chase a 1,000 to 10,000. There's great power in unity. But unity only happens when you die. And we'll share that in a few moments. You see, in the Bible, so I want to help you understand. Just, just bear with me for a few moments. We're going to build a foundation and then we're going to show you something perhaps you never saw before in the Scripture. But here it goes. In the very beginning, it says this. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother. And by the way, for all you uh, Italian moms out there, you need to pay attention to this. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother <laughs> and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be what? One flesh. Adam became and Eve became one flesh. Now we move on. In Ephesians it says the following, for this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall become one flesh, which simply means the consummation of the marriage. Let's move forward. In 1 Corinthians, the apostle Paul is talking about the immorality in that culture. I'll go ahead and read it to you and you'll see the point in a few moments. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot, which is a prostitute? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? Now, he who joins to a harlot, is he married to her? No, but they become one body. They've consummated. They've gotten together sexually. That's one flesh. The Bible says that's one flesh. That's what begins to happen. And there are ramifications of that, which we'll talk about next week. For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. So you can be married and be one flesh, but not be joined together in spirit. You'll see it in a few moments. The very next verse says this. 16 talks about one flesh, but look what it says in verse 17. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So when you are one spirit, you go enter another realm of grace and of sticking together, and God calls the two to become one, one flesh and one spirit. In fact, the Bible says, he says that Christ loved the church. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself up to her and sanctifying her and washing her in the word. So husbands, we are to be like Christ, be willing to give up our lives. And the only way you give up your lives is you die. You see, there's no good marriage where two people are living. If, once, if someone's still alive in a marriage, it's not a good marriage. There has to come a point where you die to Christ first and you need to die to yourself. We mentioned running in front of a train and saving your family is one thing, but every single day there's an opportunity. That includes a remote control. 
In Luke 9, 23, and he said unto them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. We are to follow Christ daily, die to ourselves. And let me propose to you today that analogous to that is a marriage. Christ has made it quite clear. Every day, you and I have to die to ourselves. Uh, have you guys noticed that dead people don't get too offended? Right? I mean, they don't, they don't fly off the handle. They don't get angry. They don't shoot off their mouth. They, 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 they just are just fine. Uh, in fact, uh, if you were to go to a funeral and people you looked around, you went to an open casket, you went, I, I, I defy you. But if you go to someone and go, hey, guess what? You're dead. <laughs> they say you look alive. You look dead to me. I don't like you. You know what's going to happen? They're going to say nothing. Why? Because they're dead. That wasn't very funny, was it? I tried. It's the third time I've tried it. <laughs> but the point is this. If someone is dead, they don't get offended. They don't fly off the handle. Why? I've given my life to Christ. It's not me who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And Jesus laid it all down for us. Jesus became a house slave and washed his disciples' feet. Jesus left heaven and all the wonderful blessings of heaven and submitted himself lower than the angels for a period of time as far as his, and became one of us, though he was God, to save us. And so we are to be, and let me just say this, it might be controversial, but it's in the word of God. Husbands were called to be Jesus in the relationship. And Jesus died for his church. And we are to die for our spouse. We are to lead the way, men. And it may not be popular in our culture, but I have the news for you. There are differences between men and women. It's a beautiful thing. There are differences between the night and the day. There are differences between summer and winter, but it's still the same weather. And so, listen, everybody, you see what's happening. There is a disintegration of God's structure, and when you just take away God's structure, society begins to crumble apart, and it's not because of any other reason than that. But we are to take up his cross daily, so it's about dying daily. You see, the covenant is not in force. Marriage is a covenant unless both die. That both the husband and wife have to die. And by the way, you have to die daily. Die daily to Christ and daily to each other. You can only become one when you die to ourselves. In Hebrews chapter 9, 16, just bear with me for a few moments here. It's a little theological, but hang on. The, uh, not the Apostle Paul. We're not quite sure who wrote Hebrews. But the Hebrew writer said this. For where a covenant is, that is an agreement beyond a contract. It is, it is a lifelong and often involves blood. For where a covenant is, there must be the necessity of the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead. For it is never in force while the one who made it lives. What did Jesus do? He what? He died and made a new covenant. He died that you and I can live. And the only way that you and I can receive what Christ has done for us, we have to die and be born again. Do you see that, everybody? You have to die to yourself. Now, listen, everybody. Every day, I like to get up. And I think sometimes we become zombies. Zombies, there's no such thing as a zombie, but for this case, there's a lot of great movies out there about zombies. But a zombie is, a, is the living dead. And so what happens sometimes, when your relationships get ugly, you're being a zombie. You are raising up the old man and trying to terrorize your relationship. No, you have to put that back into the grave. Oswald Chamber, one of my favorite devotionals of all times, uh, is called My Utmost for His Highest. And this is what he says in one of his devotional entries, one of my favorite ones. He says, every day, you and I have to have a white Funeral, not a white wedding by Billy Idol, a white funeral. And what that is, here today lies Eric Bucci. May he rest in peace, for I rise up with Jesus Christ. I'm here to serve my wife. He who is in the greatest in the kingdom is a servant. It goes against everything you and I have, because when, since we've been born, we've had one word that we've said. Before we said mom and dad, this is what we said, mine. Mine. And if you're a parent and you're walking on and you have more than one child, you're going to hear through the house, mine, 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 
mine, mine. And all of a sudden, it, you're trying to sit down, you're trying to watch a basketball game, and you have a, a glass of iced tea or a glass of hot tea since it's the winter, and it, it's going through your spine. You run around the house, you're trying to find who's saying mine, and invariably there is an older child taking a, a toy from a younger child, saying, and, and the older one saying, mine, 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 and you said to the, you said to the older one, give it to him. But it's mine. I don't care. Give it to him because you want peace. We always want mine. Have you noticed that? It's all about me. I want to have it my way. And I will say this, men, we don't like to share food, do we? I, I don't know what it is about women, uh, but sometimes if you go to, like, uh, pick up some fries, and I'll ask my wife, Sandra, honey, do you want anything? No, I'm not hungry at all. I'll just have some of yours. So... You order the fries, and if you go to Five Guys Burgers and Fries, which is terrible for you, put you in an early grade, but nevertheless, it's dark delicious, and the bag is greasy. And, uh, you know, I'll buy you two orders. I want that one order. In fact, I want the ones at the bottom of the bag. I want it my So we often want it my way, right? But it's really not about that, everybody. And so this insatiable attitude, you know what? It's cute when babies say mine, but when you're 40 years old saying mine, 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 you're a little baby. It's time to grow up. It's time real mature men and women, they lay down their lives for those. And you know what's so freeing when you do that, everybody? It's so freeing. You see, when you bring two leeches together and they both suck the life out of each other, both are dead. But when you and I, when, some, when you give to somebody and they give to you and I give to you, you give to me, both are, are fortified and both grow. Don't be a sucker. Be a giver. And that's what we're called to become. So our covenant is there must be necessity of death. So we talked about zombie love already. Sounds like a movie. <laughs> Why do we become one? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question. In Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, there are four chapters in it. One cha first chapter deals with, deals with God. The second one deals with, uh, with worship. The third one deals with money. And the fourth one deals with Jesus coming back. And so each of these things, the, the author is admonishing the church of his day, the Jewish people, about why their faith is bankrupt in some capacity and how to rectify it. And this is what he says about marriage. And this is the second thing you do. See, the second purpose of that book. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying. So he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by what? Both have to die. But he did not make them one, having a remembrance of the Spirit. Did, did he not make them one? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. And let me stop there for a moment before all of a sudden you're like, oh gosh, he's going to, no. God hates divorce. He does not hate divorced people. Let me say that again. God hates divorce, not divorced people. Just like God hates automobile accidents. Why would God hate automobile accidents? Because automobile accidents hurt and kill people. So he hates automobile accidents, accidents just as much as, more than, as, as divorce. Do you see that, everybody? So when the Bible says God hates divorce, it's because he hates to see people hurt. Can you not see the treachery and what's going on in our culture and the broken families and all the collateral damage and the complications and all the things that are taking place because people say, I don't want to be married anymore. Listen, I understand there's a legitimate thing that happens and it takes two parties. I understand that. But this is not God's design. And so we must speak the truth in love and not be offended by the truth. The truth will set you free. It might make you angry first, but it will set you free. And this is the truth, everybody. He hates divorce for that reason, for it covers one's garment with violence. You see all the violence in the streets and all? A lot of that's because of our broken homes, what has happened. It's caused all kinds of psychological and spiritual collateral damage, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed 
to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Now, what's so interesting is we jump all the way to the New Testament to the Apostle Peter, who I believe in context is quoting Malachi when he says the following about husbands and about prayer. Let me go ahead and read it to you. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding. It doesn't say you can understand your wife because you never can understand your wife. (laughs) And she'll never understand you. But you are to have understanding that I don't know everything. That's really helpful when you don't know everything, by the way. Okay? So... Treat her, your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be the, may weaker than you are, weaker in physical strength. That's true, by the way, including swimming teams. I have no comment on that. I have nothing to say more than that. But she is your what? Equal. Equal. Hello, everybody. Equal partner in God's gift of new life. Men And women have equal value before God. There's no such thing as man being better or less than. In fact, man came from dirt. Women came from a a level higher. She came from the rib. And that's why men never give their ribs to their wives when they go out to eat. (laughs) Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. Could it be the reason you're not successful in your business or to college or whatever you're trying to do is because you're not treating your wife with reverence and equality and grace? Could it be that, wives, your answers to prayers are not happening because you're not showing respect to your husband? There's a lot we can say about this, but relationships matter to God. And our prayers, as we saw in Malachi, God was not answering their prayers. Why? Because they were not treating marriage in the right way. They were not dead yet. My question to you, are you dead yet? Every day we have to die to become one spirit. We can only become one when we die to ourselves. Well, I happen to have a wonderful illustration here today. I have my parents here today. They've been married since um, August 29th. 1959, Uh, that means, as you can tell, I'm a mathematician, they've been married 62 years, so I'm going to ask them to make their way up. And rather than me talk about marriage, which I I just did, I'd rather have people that have a little bit of torque behind what that means and have some clout. And they've been married for many, many years. And it's been a blessing to sit under their leadership and and to be able to pass. My dad was a pastor. I never wanted to be a pastor, by the way. But apparently it's in my blood. And uh, But what a blessing it is that I get to move on to the next generation. And so I just wanted to ask you guys about dying, of course. We'll talk about that in a few moments. But what are the top three things that have allowed you to have a successful growing marriage, which you have said their marriage is better and greater in every capacity, yes, even that capacity, than it was when they were first married. And, and that's what they said. They have grown closer together. What are the top three things that has shaped and made you to be able to be up here for 62 years, going on 63 and 83? Well, I'm hoping that you'll be around in 20 years. First of all, I do want to thank the Lord that we are married 62 years and will be 63 in August. Uh, It certainly is a blessing, and we've been through a lot. But the most important thing I would say is that I have experienced the Lord. I've accepted the Lord. The Holy Spirit lives within me, and that has made the biggest difference in our marriage, our relationship with the Lord. Without the Lord, it would be a lot different. But I praise him that I've come to know him as an early age, and I always wanted to have a husband that loved Jesus. As I think I've told the congregation, when I was 16, I had a supernatural experience. I met Jesus Christ. He came and touched me, told me he loved me, and my name was written in the book of life. He did that after I died to self asking him to forgive me for my sins and to come to my life. And he did. And I was never the same since that day. 
So that was the first thing that happened. But we're talking about marriage. Now, as a freshman at college, I was standing on the grass. Standing on the grass, not smoking the grass. Go ahead. <laughs> Let me make that clear. On October, and four guys were with me, and this cute girl walks by. And my heart went, whew, and but so did three other guys along with me. <laughs> so I had to talk to them privately and say, hey, bug out. That's the one I want. Leave. <laughs> now, I thought to myself, that's the girl I want to marry. They call that puppy love. It's kind of dumb because I didn't know anything about her. And the Bible says, when you find somebody, be equally yoked. Yeah. And what you really need to do, a lot of marriages start off wrong because it has to start in Christ. Amen. And if that person isn't interested in Christ, then find somebody else. Don't say, oh, I'll marry him to change him. I haven't seen too many of that happen. It does, but not too often. So that's the first thing, yeah. is to make sure that the one you are interested in has already died to Christ and now wants to live for Christ. So that's the first important thing. You know, Dr. Doug, Doug Weiss, who has been to this church on several occasions, he's a uh, psychologist and a marriage counselor. He said the following. He said that when you're married, the, imagine found Jesus, and this is uh, my mom and dad, that Jesus is the center of the relationship and that she is a daughter and he's a son, and they had to look at Jesus. And it's a trinity of, of my mom and dad and Jesus. And that's what makes a strong marriage. And so that's the first thing, is a Christ-centered relationship. What would you say with the second thing that has helped you in all these years? Unfortunately, we didn't have marital counseling before we got married. And the important thing was communication. Yeah. Because I had to understand where she came from. She was an only child. There's five brothers and four sisters in my family, even though I was brought up in foster homes. And so I was brought up where they used to scream and holler at me, told me I was never going to amount to anything, and gave me a whole lot of negative stuff. They said, you'd be lucky if you end, don't end up in jail. Not Yale, jail. <laughs> now, her family, she's the only child, the mother and Father never raised their voices. They were quiet. So I had to learn because I loved her, but I wasn't used to speaking. I was speaking up here, and I had to lower my tone, my quality of voice, so she could receive it. And as we started to come along like this, we found that there were a lot of things that we had to adjust to. I noticed that my wife wasn't quite as loving. And one day she said to me, after we were married actually 17 years, she said, there are 700 people in this church that have a wonderful pastor. I wish I had one. And I realized I was doing something wrong. Because of my inferiority, I had to work extra hard to lay myself up so people could appreciate me as a pastor. And I didn't realize what I was doing as I was putting my wife after my job. Now, God uses all of us, but that job that we have can't be number one. It has to be Christ first. Mm -hmm. Then my wife, then my children, then my job. Right. And when I realized that, I realized what I was doing. And through communicating, we began to work out these things. What I wanted to say, too, is that uh, he was very, very tied up with people in the church because they had a lot of issues. But also, I had three sons at home. And, and one problem child. You know, you know what it is when you're when you're an only child and you're growing up, you have no one to fight with. 
You have no one to be angry with. And when your parents told me, all right, it's time to go to bed, okay, mom, I will. There was no hostility. There was no anger. And all of a sudden, I find myself with three boys. And they said, mine, 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 a lot. <laughs> you did. <laughs> I still do. So it was a whole training for me. I said, boy, how do people do all this? And then with my husband not being around, and he was helping this person in the church, that person in the church. And I thought, oh, what am I going to do? I don't know how to. Three boys and even three girls would be hard. I mean, what am I going to do? And so I felt very alone. And so I had to communicate my feelings to my husband. And after I spoke to him and explained to him, he started to understand. Then I did something I should have been doing all along. I said, Friday night, from now on, will be our date night. We're going to go out on a date. Now, I didn't know if she wanted to at that time, but we went out on a date. Every Friday was our date night. And I said, look, I need to help you more at home. Saturday, let me take over. I'll take the kids, give you a break. Then I started giving her a dozen roses. Through communication, I found out she appreciates one rose more. <laughs> but I started to die to self and realize I had to lift her up above my own. So I really became her servant. And yeah. wow, yeah. when I touched her heart, everything else was great. Absolutely. And then I started to really realized that I married a man of integrity. That's such an important word, integrity. Amen. <clears throat> and to this day, I can say without any doubt that he has been every single year, every single day, he's been a man of his word. And he's interested in people. And now we can share together. We can do a lot together as far as helping other people. A lot of times we're together and... Uh, we needed to communicate a little bit more. And one of the things that I have found is that, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that I have found, it's very hard at home to communicate sometimes. So all of a sudden you'll say, oh, the dishes are in the sink, I can take care of that. Oh, look at the dust over there, I should take care of that. And you're not really thinking about communicating with your husband. So what we have found, and we do this even to this day, we go out in the car, and we might go to a coffee shop and get a cup of coffee, or we might even take our own coffee, who knows. But we'll sit in the car in a nice, maybe a park or someplace where we can uh, uh, see people. We want to see people. So we'll sit there, and we'll talk, and we'll communicate, and I'll tell them some of the things that are in my heart. See, at home, that wouldn't happen because there's too many distractions. So we sit in the car, and sometimes we'll see another car go by, and we'll see a bunch of children crying, and, the, and then we'll say, let's pray for that family. We start praying for that family. We'll sit in the car, and we'll start praying for our kids, our son Eric, <laughs> here in the church. We'll, we'll, then, we'll pray about all the grandchildren. So it's a wonderful time. Sometimes you just need to get away from the house yeah. and go in a quiet place. Maybe there's a park you can go to. No distractions, and we find that very, and Jesus meets us every single time. I should also mention that <clears throat> I guess because we all both knew Christ, we had always Bible reading with our family, worship with our family, and prayer. So we had that, and maybe that's the reason why all three of our sons grew up to know the Lord, to love the Lord, to marry a woman that loves the Lord and bring their children up in the way of the Lord. Yeah. You know, you said a couple of things, and I do want to kind of summarize what we talked about. We mentioned the fact that three things are probably is more, is obviously more than three things, but number one, a personal commitment to Jesus Christ is, is essential um, and, and center of your marriage. The second thing you mentioned was priorities and life. And my dad's generation because uh, I know a lot of pastors in this generation, uh, they quote the scripture verse where it says, he who loves father, mother, husband, and wife more than me is not worthy of me. 
and they misunderstood the context of the scripture because it, it's not as true. You can't love anyone more than God, but they equate ministry work as equal to God, and it's not. And so my dad, trying to serve God, uh, I've heard pastors say at, at a retirement party, I praise God he put the ministry over his family. Like, oh, my gosh. And all the kids are, wh are whacked out because they feel like they're not important. And, and so it, it's so important, everybody, and my parents have taught me that because, and even that, that, that number God, God first, then your marriage, then the children, not the children and then your marriage because the kids leave, hopefully. <laughs> I did, finally. And, and so that, and, and then your vocation and, and that order, and order matters. If you're not in order, you are in disorder and they had a disorder, and their marriage was on the rocks, but God restored their marriage, and now they're married 62 years. So maybe some of you, maybe your marriage is about ready to fall apart. Maybe you have not, want nothing to do with that person. But listen, everybody, it, you have to die and do things God's way. And so I just want to conclude with one little thing. You mentioned that, uh, Mom, about different seasons of life. I think it's important to realize that in a marriage relationship, there are different seasons. And so there's before kids, kids. Teenagers, uh, empty nest, and then retirement. So why don't you just go ahead and mention that? Yeah. Each one is, you have to change. Life has changed. So you have to, one of the things I realized, I didn't know how fast from baby to 12 went by so fast. And I, <laughs> I missed that, you know, but I can't be taking them and holding them and cuddling like I used to, you know. But... Uh, <laughs> We're now in the final season of our life. If we have 10 years, I don't know if we've lived that long, but we don't know. But today, I recognize the fact that time is precious. So what I want to do more than anything else is die to myself. I love my, my Mary and with all my heart and soul. And just being with her is precious. And just, just loving her and, and pleasing her is my desire now. Amen. Amen. Okay. It's hard to see straight now. Um, but, you know, I appreciate that. I really do, and, and I just want to let everyone know, maybe you're sitting out there thinking, I, I screwed up. Well, welcome to the club. We all have. God's a God of restoration and new beginnings, and I don't know where you are with God, but the most important question is, how are you with Jesus? How are you with Jesus? We're all going to die. Whether it's tomorrow or 20 years from now, we're all going to die, unless he comes back. We're all going to die. Are you ready to meet Jesus? It's that simple. And if you don't know for sure, it's not about everybody else. You don't have to get your affairs in order because you never can. God has. And so if you've never given your life to Jesus, today is the day of salvation. Maybe you used to walk with Christ and no longer walk anymore. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. So I, we want to give you an opportunity. I never want to leave this opportunity ever if I don't have to. How many of you would say today that I've never truly given my life completely to Jesus, but today... I want to. Just a quick show of hands. Anyone that would say, I used to walk with God and I've walked away and I want to get right. Just a quick show of hands. Nice and high. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Several of you for both and also online. Let's pray this prayer together. It's the prayer in concert with God. You know, repeat after me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong. Today, I choose to step down from being God in my life. I give my life to you. Every part, take my life. It is yours. I ask you also to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. Thank you that today I am a new creation. I'm in you. 
and you are my loving Father. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe Jesus says you're born again, and we want to help you in your journey. We don't pretend for a moment that you say a prayer and you're, you're good to go. Jesus says, come follow me. This church is a bunch, a bunch of folks that are following Christ. They're a pocket in front of your seat. You want to pull that out and, and put there my commitment today. Also, you can get your phone and you can text to 860-499-4888. That's 499 and put believe and we'll help you with the next steps. Right after the service today, we're gonna have a team of people up front to pray with you. Also, you can go to the front desk and you can get a Bible and we'll help you with our next steps. We're starting our small groups called uh, Fresh Start to help you with that next process. Hey, before we leave here today, everybody, I wanna also give you an opportunity to give back. You don't have to give, but you get to give. There are four different ways you can give. There are boxes in the back if you're here in person. Uh, you can give. You can text to give at 833-245-5608. Go online as well. Let me just tell you something. It's supernatural. Mom and dad can tell you, right? You guys been doing this for how many years? Has God always met your needs? Yes. Always. Yes. And you've tithed in the most difficult sets of circumstances, and God's always met your needs, and he's blessed them tremendously as a result. And so I just want to let you know it works, everybody. Not so you can drive a Bentley. Yeah, but be say it. It's yeah. not only blessed us. A tithe wasn't enough. We keep giving and giving. Amen. And so if God can trust you, he can give you more. So Father, bless this offering today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to have people up front to pray with you today. But I'm going to ask my father to be, do me a big favor. You guys could all stand if you could. He's going to give the benediction. or what, Benediction simply means blessing. And at our time here today. Father. May your blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon this congregation, Lord God. I pray that you meet needs that they've had and as they've come, that you would meet them. Meet them in such a way that they know that they are blessed by you. And the blessings of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit descend on them and bless them now and forevermore. Amen.